Welcome to this webinar on the topic of medicines in podiatry. It is part of the CPD series being provided by the College of Podiatry. I'm Alan Borthwick, Emeritus Professor at the University of Southampton and Chair of the Medicines and Medical Devices Committee. I'm also a member of Council. My colleague is Tony Mayer. He's a consultant podiatric surgeon at Nottinghamshire Healthcare NHS Foundation Trust. And this webinar is based on the paper that we published back in October of last year in Podiatry Now. Uh, today, we will answer some of the common questions that members often ask us via a question and answer approach. So Tony is going to ask the, the first question and then I'll answer it and then we'll take it from there. So, Tony. Hey, thank you, Alan. So can I ask to start with, how are medicines classified and what do the classifications mean? Thanks. Uh, there are three principal classifications of medicines under the Medicines Act, which was passed in 1968. General sales list, pharmacy only, and prescription only medicines, otherwise known as POMs. General sales list drugs are obtained with fewer restrictions than the other drugs. Uh, they can be bought at places such as the local supermarket, they, they can be placed in your shopping basket and purchased at the till. Uh, pharmacy only medicines can only be sold by or with the authority of a registered pharmacist and they have to be sold over the counter effectively. Uh, such as you would at Boots Pharmacy Counter, or for that matter, any other pharmacy. Prescription-only medicines require a prescription issued by an approved prescriber. Now, under the Medicines Act in 1968, that largely consisted only of doctors and dentists. But since then, it's been extended with non-medical prescribers to include suitably qualified podiatrists. There is another category um, but it's not a category defined by the Medicines Act. It's actually defined by the misuse of drugs legislation, uh, and that's called controlled drugs. Um, but we, we can talk a little bit more about those later. Thank you. And Alan, what, what do each of our medicines annotations allow us to do? Uh, good question. Uh, there are four recognised annotations in medicines that we can see on our HCPC register. There is the POMS, which stands for supply, and that allows us to sell or supply medicines from a specific list. Uh, and that presently consists of about 11 medicines, including medicines like erythromycin or flucloxacillin or amorolfine cream. The uh, POMA annotation stands for administration, and it, that allows us to administer prescription-only medicines, which we're going to administer to patients. There's 10 of those. They're mainly local anaesthetics, uh, but it also includes adrenaline and the corticosteroid agent, methylprednisolone. Uh, SP is supplementary prescribing, and that, of course, allows a suitably qualified podiatrist to prescribe medicines, as agreed in a clinical management plan uh, arranged with a doctor and a pharmacist, and sometimes a microbiologist. Whereas independent prescribing uh, does allow us to prescribe uh, prescription-only medicines following our own diagnosis and treatment plan, uh, but it is limited to some extent in that we don't have access to unlicensed medicines as independent prescribers, and there is a limit to the range of control drugs that we have access to. But again, we can chat a little further about that later. So Alan, what is the difference between supply of a medicine and prescribing a medicine? Thanks, that's, that's also a really good question. Supply uh, legally is to provide a medicine directly to a patient or a carer for administration. And that's particularly relevant to our exemptions, and it's also what happens when you use a patient group direction. Uh, administration is slightly different to supply in that that involves uh, the way of, a way of giving medicine by usually parenteral administration by injection. But it can also apply uh, if you're using external application of a drug, such as an impregnated dressing. 
Uh, prescription, however, is, an, is different. It, that occurs via uh, an FP10 order, a written order, uh, issued by an approved prescriber and is dispensed by a pharmacist. So that's essentially the difference between the two. I wonder if I can ask you a question now, Tony, um, about exemptions. I wonder, do the exemptions offer adequate access to medicines? Uh, thank you, Alan. Well, the, the difficulty with both the POM-A and the POM-S annotations is that they offer access to only a limited list of medicines. And that list doesn't necessarily uh, keep pace with changes in professional practice. For example, the POM-S list includes the macrolide antibiotic, erythromycin, which historically was considered a useful alternative to the penicillin antibiotics in those who are allergic. However, erythromycin is not always very well tolerated. And so local antibiotic formularies now often recommend the better tolerated uh, clarithromycin from the same class of macrolide antibiotics. Unfortunately, we cannot access clarithromycin via our POM-S annotation, and so we'd have to turn to either patient group directions or independent prescribing. Another example, this time from the POM-A list, would be methylprednisolone, uh, perhaps better known as depamedrone, a corticosteroid injection, which is useful in the treatment of a range of localised inflammatory, inflammatory joint and soft tissue conditions. Now, supposing a patient has previously reacted poorly to depamedrone, we have no alternative corticosteroid available to us, so we'd again have to turn to patient group directions or independent prescribing. Uh, now, Alan, I do have another question for you. Could you explain what a signed order provision is and how it works? Yes, yes. A signed order provision was something that we attained from the Commission on Human Medicines back in 2011. It's an order written by a podiatrist who has the POMS annotation. And it allows you to give this via the patient to a pharmacist for dispensing. And this is an arrangement which is made uh, with the podiatrist and the pharmacist, where the pharmacist will actually hold the medicines, not the podiatrist. So this saves the podiatrist from, from holding medicines in the medicines cabinet, perhaps in the practice, which might reach its sell-by date before being used. It's a very uh, effective uh, measure used in private practice. Uh, and there is a template provided by the College of Podiatry, which explains what it should look like and with what details should be included in it. Thank you, Alan. Uh, now, I mentioned uh, patient group directions a moment ago. Uh, can you explain what they are um, and what they allow you to do? Uh, thanks. Yes. Uh, patient group directions... Uh, used to be known as group protocols in the 90s. Uh, and then in the year 2000, they were given legal status as patient group directions. And they allow podiatrists to supply certain prescription-only medicines to groups of patients, usually filling a specified group criteria. Uh, so they have a shelf life of around about two years, and they need to be agreed in advance uh, by the lead clinician and a pharmacist, and as I mentioned earlier, a microbiologist if you're supplying antibiotics. Uh, they can be used to supply a small range of controlled drugs, but emphatically not pregabalin, gabapentin, or tramadol. Um, and there are only certain professions which are eligible to use patient group directions. There are 30 professions. The most recent addition to that list were dental therapists and dental hygienists about four or five years ago. Again, let me ask you a question, Tony, about uh, patient group directions. Are PGDs commonly used in clinical practice? Uh, yes, thank you, Alan. Yes, uh, PGDs are still commonly used in practice, but I would say that is slowly changing as each year more podiatrists gain independent prescribing qualifications. 
Locally, where I work in Nottingham, there's a real drive to reduce the reliance on PGDs in favour of independent prescribing. In fact, my healthcare trust now has over 300 non-medical prescribers. Uh, and recent data from PASCOM uh, reveals that independent prescribing is now the primary method of accessing medicines uh, in podiatric surgery, uh, with PGDs now only accounting for 21%. And Alan, uh, what is the difference between supplementary prescribing and independent prescribing? Uh, supplementary prescribing is a three-way partnership arrangement, essentially, in which the doctor or the independent prescriber establishes the diagnosis first and outlines the treatment plan. And the treatment plan is known as the CMP or the Clinical Management Plan, and that allows access to a, quite a wide range of, uh, of medicines and uh, actually a wider range of control drugs than is available to independent prescriber podiatrists. Uh, an independent podiatrist, independent prescriber podiatrist, does establish the diagnosis, does outline the treatment plan, and prescribes accordingly from any medicine in the British National Formulary that is within their recognised scope of practice, with the exception of unlicensed medicines, uh, control drugs broadly, although they do have access to a specified list of control drugs, but at the moment there are only four drugs on that list. However, uh, mixing of medicines is allowed and off-label uh, use of medicines is permitted. And I wanted to ask you a question, Tony, about that, that latter point. Uh, in what scenarios would a podiatrist access supplementary or independent prescribing? So the requirement for a signed clinical management plan, I think, uh, limits the utility of supplementary prescribing for many uh, working in traditional podiatry settings. However, those uh, advanced Podiatrists working closely with medical colleagues, perhaps in a diabetes MDT or, or in rheumatology, may find uh, supplementary prescribing particularly uh, useful. Uh, for those that uh, don't have direct access to um, medics, um, I suspect independent prescribing is the best solution, offering podiatrists the opportunity to provide the right care at the right time in the right place. So in podiatric surgery, for, for example, we have been able, through independent prescribing, to minimise excess return to GPs with requests for uh, medicines required to support patients through the perioperative period. So I have another question for you, Alan. How does independent prescribing differ from prescribing by doctors? Mm, that's a very good point. There are differences. Uh, doctors essentially may access any medicine, uh, whether it's licensed or not, essentially, whereas podiatrists aren't quite in that position. If they're independent prescribers, they're, they're not allowed to access unlicensed medicines. They can do it to some extent as supplementary prescribers via a, a, um, a CMP, a clinical management plan, but not otherwise, not as independent prescribers. And as I mentioned before, they're not able to access all controlled drugs only a, a specified list, uh, and that's limited at present to, to four medicines. So that essentially is the, is the difference between doctor and independent prescribing by podiatrists. Uh, Alan, you mentioned uh, unlicensed medicines there. Can you explain what an unlicensed medicine is and how does it differ from off-label off or off-licensed medicines? Thanks. Yes, that's a common question that comes to us at the Medicines Committee. Uh, because they are quite different. Uh, unlicensed medicines are medicines which have no marketing authorization at all, or no product license. A product license is granted by the MHRA, which is the Medicines and Healthcare Products Regulatory Agency. And therefore, if it hasn't got a license, it may not have been assessed for efficacy, safety, or quality in the same way that licensed medicines are. Off-label or off-license use of a medicine isn't the same thing. Uh, this refers to the use of a licensed medicine uh, for a purpose other than that specified in the license itself. Now, it's 
perfectly legal for podiatrists to use medicines in an off-label way if it's in the course of their professional practice. Uh, doctors, dentists, uh, nurse, pharm uh, nurse independent prescribers and pharmacist independent prescribers can access unlicensed medicines, but obviously podiatrists uh, can't. Uh, and as I mentioned, supplementary prescribers can access unlicensed medicines, uh, but not if they're acting in a capacity as an independent prescriber. So uh, can I ask you a question, Tony? Um, are there instances where you would prescribe or administer medicines off license? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, absolutely there are. So many colleagues will be familiar with uh, mepivacaine hydrochloride, otherwise known as Scandinest, uh, a local anaesthetic, which we access via our POM-A exemptions, and it's commonly used uh, to facilitate pain-free nail surgery. Yet the current license for this drug is for dental treatment only, though both the MHRA and the College of Podiatry acknowledge and accept the routine use of this medicine. The colleague, uh, sorry, the college is now working with uh, the manufacturer to support the relicensing of this medicine with the MHRA. Uh, now, I do have another question for you, Alan. Uh, what are controlled drugs and how do we go about accessing them? Okay. Um... Control drugs are effectively drugs which are controlled under the misuse of drugs legislation. Uh, there are two forms of legislation governing um, controlled drugs. One is the Misuse of Drugs Act from 1971. That's the primary legislation. And that defines classes on the basis of harmfulness if misused. So that would be class A drug, class B or class C. The Misuse of Drugs Regulations from 2001 uh, also has schedules, and these schedules determine effectively who can possess and supply the controlled drugs. Uh, and so um, podiatrists, uh, independent prescriber podiatrists, can access uh, four of such medicines from a, a very limited list. So that's essentially what they are and how we get hold of them. Can I ask you a question um, about controlled drugs? Uh, would better access to controlled drugs improve patient care? Well, Alan, I, th I, I really think it would. There are two areas where better access to controlled drugs would likely improve patient care. So neuropathic pain in uh, patients with diabetes and also post-operative pain following uh, podiatric surgery. So taking the example of post-operative pain, we currently have the option of preemptive analgesia utilizing local anesthetic nerve blocks. We can supply GSL medicines such as paracetamol and ibuprofen. If we want to offer additional relief for moderate pain, we can consider the compound um, analgesics such as uh, codidromol, or alternatively, we could supply the opioid analgesic codeine phosphate Though we're not able to prescribe it, we can, we can supply it. Utilising our independent prescribing qualifications, we could prescribe a range of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and a single opioid, dihydrocodine. Now, we know from our PASCOM data that around 5% of patients report that their pain relief was inadequate following podiatric surgery. Typically, these patients will have experienced breakthrough pain Currently, we do not have adequate access to opioids such as Oromorph to manage moderate to severe pain, which means uh, care will have to be transferred to our medical colleagues, which will result often in, in delays uh, for, for patient care. Thanks, Tony. Um, on that topic, I wonder if I can also ask another question. Uh, much has been written about the opioid crisis in the USA. And I just wondered what measures should we as podiatrists take to keep our patients safe? Mm. Well, that's a huge concern. I think not just for professionals, but for our society as a, as a whole. I think we all have a duty to manage pain responsibly and safely, part of which will include judicious use of opioid medicines. Now, for the most part, the greatest risk lies with the management of chronic pain, which podiatrists don't routinely treat. 
However, opioid, opioids prescribed for acute pain do also pose a risk. At present, when planning management with a, with a patient, we take a holistic approach and where possible look to avoid opioid uh, medicines unless moderate to severe post-surgical pain is anticipated. And that's in line with uh, NICE guidance. NHS trusts have recently made efforts to increase awareness of the problem and, and again locally in Nottingham we receive regular alerts and reminders on opioid safety in our clinical supervision ses sessions. I think though if we do gain greater access to controlled drugs in the future education providers and perhaps the College of Podiatry will need to consider providing updates and CPD on this crucial subject. Um, there is though a, a wealth of resources already available online. Uh, thank you, Tony. Um, uh, we hope that this presentation has been useful. We've tried to make the material as straightforward as possible. Uh, legislation and regulations do change from time to time, so that we must keep an eye on any and all changes that affect podiatry. Uh, the Medicines and Medical Devices Committee does function uh, to keep us all up to date with these changes and to keep the membership informed. Thanks very much. Thank you.